Well, if you notice, my George juice jar is full. Uh, this is the same stuff that we get from back home. Uh, yeah, it, it, Cade's looking a little nervous and also a little inquisitive, aren't you, Cade? You know you want to, Cade. No, you don't. All right. It's water. Be careful, guys. It's water. Uh, so, but uh, I, I want to, this week, have we not had an awesome week? Think of all the things that's going on this week and, and how we can celebrate. I mean, our cheerleading squad and the numbers they received, really, of all the different divisions, you were the top notch. Very, I mean, awesome. That is just awesome stuff. Uh, precision. It's great. Um, and, and, you know, the cheerleading squad's wonderful. Our football team took on the number one team in the state. And, and I walked over to, to shake some hands, and I, I walked over, and I thought he was a coach, but he was just a father. And he said, we knew we had this one tonight. We knew we had it coming in. And I kind of tried not to smile. I'm, 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 I'm sorry for it. No, I'm not, but I'm, I'm sorry for it. Um, the determination of our football team. The hours of practice paid off, and we've seen them just, you know, just, man, man, I was excited. Wow! Our, but here's the deal. If we're filling our joyous juice jar with those things, in four or five years, we'll forget about it. I mean, it's great. It's, it's 1989, the last time we went to state. I don't know if we won or lost. I, somebody here probably knows. But if that's what we're filling, we're going to be empty after a while. We need to be filling everything, and I'm so thankful, man, I don't believe in, in drinking. I don't drink, but my wife and I decided if any more of these close games, we might have to rethink that. Uh, got a little nervous. My, my wife kept grabbing her, her you just, come on, boys, get this over with. This is killing me. And she turned to me and said, we can't go to grandma's. We can't go to her mother's for Thanksgiving. I'm disappointed. <laughs> That's not a frown, is it? Uh, you know, I said, honey, I said, I, I back your decisions, whatever you say. I, I'm here to support your decision. Oh, well, we can't go. That means she can't go Black Friday shopping is what I heard. She said, no, I can still do that. What are you filling your life with? If it's situations and circumstances, you're going to be disappointed. If everything has to go right in your life for you to have joy in your life and contentment in your life, you're going to go through life miserable. This world has an enemy. You have an enemy, and that enemy is Satan, and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I have come so that you may have life and joy, and I want you to have both of those to the fullest. I want you to have joy to the fullest. But you have an enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So what is he after? He's after your joy. He's after your life. He wants to destroy you, and he wants to destroy everything that God wants for you through Jesus Christ. Satan wants to distract you. When you look at Philippians chapter 3, and you weren't here last week, we had uh, Bob speak at this hour, but first hour, when you look at last week's sermon, Philippians 3, the things you see is what... Paul was focusing on. What's his frame of mind? In verse 12 of chapter 3, you see he was aware of his current situations. In chapter tw uh, uh, verse 12, you see that he was determined to be faithful in Christ. In chapter 13, you see that he was focused on progress. I'm moving forward. In, chapter, in verse 14, you see that he's going to be diligent in these matters. He's going to continue to gain ground in his walk with God. That was his focus. One of the words that you don't see in Philippians chat in the book of Philippians, but is, is right there everywhere in every chapter, is focus. Focus. You can't win this life if you don't focus. You can't win the game if you don't focus. If you, if you don't look what's ahead of you, the prize is always ahead of us. Philippians, the outline is proclaim Christ that leads to courage. Chapter 2 is to be humble like Christ. It leads to the light. Chapter 3 is you suffer like Christ. It leads to perseverance. Chapter 4, this one, is if you rejoice in Christ, it leads to peace. Peace. And peace comes when you get yourself into Christ and you rejoice regardless. I'm going to rejoice. And yet, and yet, I will praise you. 
If I get down, it's on my knees to praise God. I'm going to get back up. If you wanted to, you can go through life and look at everything that's wrong. There are people that went to the same game I went to and can focus on all the things that we did wrong. You ever get around people, I, I call it, it's a contagious disease, and a lot of people have it. Yeah, I call it stinking thinking. You ever get around somebody with stinking thinking? You don't go in to a game like that on Friday night with the thought that you've lost because you'll lose. You don't go in to something like that ahead of time thinking of all the mistakes you've made to, to get here. You get in there because of all the successes. Look how we made it. We can do this. In life, in our spiritual life, it is a struggle. And if you quit struggling, you're going to fail. We heard Bob last week tell us that we need to do Proverbs 24. And he told us that we need to focus our life on Proverbs 24. And Proverbs 24 tells us that we've got to change our mind and what we're thinking about through our heart. You see, in the Bible, the heart and the mind are tied together. When you're talking about emotions, you're talking about both of them. It's your thoughts connected with your heart. We're going to see in Philippians chapter 4 today that he tells us that we have a purpose and we have a, have a situation to where we have to choose what we think on, what goes into our lives. And we can have stinking thinking. You can be a Christian and have stinking thinking. And it's contagious. You get around somebody that has stinking thinking pretty soon, you have it. When I was a high schooler, I worked on a hog farm with a buddy of mine, and we were going to a basketball game, and his dad said, hey, guys, said, I left the water on for the hogs. Can you go through there and shut the, shut the water off? Sure. We didn't touch nothing. We walked into there, into the hog barn, shut the water off, got back to his truck, and I said, you stink. He said, well, I think you stink. And he had a bottle of cologne in his car just so when any time he had to go to the hog lot, he can, you don't have to touch nothing and you smell. Anybody ever work with hogs? Am I speaking the truth? They, you just have to be around them. There are people, you just got to get around them. And it's contagious. But you know what else is contagious? Joy. Getting through a situation and finding, finding the inner guts to get through it. And, and I found this, and, and let me tell you what, this will just kill you. I don't know who said this, but they're smarter than me. Joy should be the normal state of a Christian. It's normal. Abnormal is when we get down. Joy should be the normal state. It is our duty to rejoice in the Lord regardless. Regardless. And this last one I had to think about for a minute. The more we rejoice in him, the more spiritual minded you'll become. You draw closer to him because you're thinking about him. Joy isn't, I always thought that was a sissy word, a, a fluffy word. Joy in Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. It is a positive. It's something we need to get through life. It is that inner gut feeling. I'm going to make it. My God is still in the problem-solving business. I don't have to worry whether or not he's going to take care of it. I know he's going to take care of it. I just need to sit back and watch. My God is still in the mountain-moving business. There's a mountain in ahead of me. I don't care because my God can still move mountains. I, I am looking out at a crowd today of people who shouldn't be in church. But God is in a mountain-moving business. There are people here today you know it's because God got a hold of you. And there's an inner joy in your life, and you tried to, to fix it with drugs. And you tried to, to hide in a bottle and get into some alcohol. You tried everything else. You tried it all. But it wasn't until God became real in your life. And when God became real, there's that joy. You feel your George used jar. Do you realize that the reason we're going through Philippians 
is it begins and ends with thankfulness. There's a command at the end of it. Be thankful. God has called you. You're a child of God. Whatever you're going through in this life is something that you can use so that the world can see Jesus in you. And and I, I love all these victories we're having. I love it all. Now, how do we do this and present Jesus Christ to people that don't know him? You guys that are on a football team, you know you've got friends on that team that don't know Jesus Christ. Here you go. Here you go. Here's an opportunity. Those on the cheerleading squad, those who are on cross country, these are opportunities that you can use. Use them. Show them Jesus. Be thankful for all circumstances. See, the book of Philippians chapter 4, the chapter is about defeating anxiety and the secret to contentment. That's chapter 4. Here's how you defeat anxiety, and here's how you become content. The first part of it is you got to have peace with fellow Christians. I'm going to tell you something here, and you're not going to believe this, but do you realize that there are going to be times that we're going to disagree? Oh, oh, here we go. The Cowboys are the number one football team in the NFL. I think they're the best. You see, you, you, can, you can be wrong, and we can still be okay. See, America has got to the point where they don't know how to disagree. They don't know how to have a difference of opinion, and you'd be wrong and I'd be right. They don't know how to do this. And what I think is interesting is, isn't it amazing how strong people can be on social media and hide behind a computer screen? You wouldn't say that to my face because you know you wouldn't have a face. We've got to learn how to disagree. And what was going on in Philippians, we don't know what was going on in Philippi, but there were two ladies that had a disagreement. And he says, I want you two to get, to get along. Figure it out. Become of one mind. Figure this out. I hate confrontation. I hate it. Um, I, I like the Cimarron game because we went in there 36, whatever. I can relax. We're winning. You know, that, that my heart was, was okay. These last couple games... My, my high blood pressure medicine ain't kicking in. You know what I mean? Uh, it's nerve-wracking. But you know what I love about what I see? You can't pick one person out that's the team. It goes from the coaching staff to the kicker to the, to the front line to the defensive line to the quarterback. It's the team, and they got to work together. they got to all know the same play because if they don't know the same play and you're running back, if Jonah's over here running to the left and you're thinking – you messes up. That's the same way with the church. We've got to be of the same mind. And it's what we're focused on. What are we focused on? Next year, and John's not here to tell us, but we, as the elders, got together and had a meeting, and we know his wife. We know, Jennifer, you give it to him. But he came up with this great idea about, I said, what's our goal going to be for next year? And he says, well, there needs to be something with vision because of 2020. But he had his phone out when he was saying it. So we know you're feeding him text. We know. We know. We know. But that's our goal next year is what is your vision? What are you focused on? Do you have a 2020 vision? And the thing that I'm going to work on with you, I want everyone here, every one of you, the beginning of the year to go into a time of prayer and fasting over what is your responsibility for the church body, but also who is God sending you out to? I want to see you leading someone to the Lord. I want to see you getting in the water of grave of baptism with somebody and you baptizing them to the Lord. And I want you, Lord, who is it you want me to lead to you? They may not come to this church. They might be from Wichita or they might be in college down in Ozark, wherever they're at. Who is God telling you to get a hold of? Who are you focused on? In order to do that, you've got to go into Psalms 139 where, where David said, search me, O God. Know my inner thoughts. See if there be any evil way in me. Search me. That's a scary thought. What's wrong with me? Now, I can stand up here and tell you what's wrong with you. (laughs) But what's wrong with me? And then at the end of that same passage, he tells him to search him again. That's what I want us to see in the new year. But in order to do that, we've got to learn to get along. So we have, do you know that Peter and Paul disagreed in Acts 15? Peter was not accepting the Gentile believers, and Paul had a problem with it. And he went right up to him to his face and said, I've got a problem with what you're doing. We've got to fix this. Galatians, he talks about the problem he had with with Peter, another apostle. 
We've got to fix this. There's got to be a way that you come together and agree and fix the problem. The next thing is you've got to have peace with God. And the way you have peace with God is to know what's important to God, and that's what you're going to think about. You're going to think the way God thinks. And the word there used is the word meditate. It's the idea of transforming who we are by renewing our mind. It goes into Romans 12. And holiness starts with a prepared mind. My college basketball coach told me that every game is won before you get on the court because you got to win it up here. Doubt creeps in. In basketball, we quit making shots. If you miss a couple, you quit shooting. If you start fouling a guy, you quit playing defense. It's right here. The battle of the mind. And the battle of the mind is also the battle of the heart. They go together. You start doubting yourself, and that doubt creeps in, and then you have insufficiency in your life, and, and all of a sudden you start backing off. You can't back off. I want to read to you, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. And, and I want you to, does that sound like, like a suggestion? Is he suggesting to you, hey, if you feel like it, go ahead and, and rejoice? No. It is a command, no matter what, rejoice. The next command, let your gentleness be evident to all. That's a command. The Lord is near. He's not saying the return of the Lord is near. He's saying, hey, wherever you're at, the Lord is with you. Be careful. Let your gentleness, treat him like Jesus would treat him. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. That's a command. Those are the commands of the New Testament to the church. And look at the outcome. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. Because here, how it guards your minds. You're going to think like God. Finally, this is a conclusion of the matter. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And look at verse 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. Can you say that? Can you tell somebody to follow me? Hey, follow me. I know the way. I was watching football last night, and one of the things I liked about football, that guy's going to bug me all day. One of the things I liked, I was watching OU, forgive me, please forgive me. But the running back put his hand on the back of the guy in front of him and let him lead the way. That is following me. I know how to get you through this. Whatever you have heard or learned or received in me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. See the outcome? Think about these things. You, your responsibility, you think about these things. And, and look at these words, and I looked up these Greek words. The word for true is unconcealed evidence, things you know for certain. God has given us his word, it's unconcealed evidence. We know there is a God. We know who God is, and we know Jesus Christ. Why? Because we have his written word. It's unconcealed evidence. Things you can take to the bank, it's something that's concrete. Things that are noble, which is something you revere. Things that are right, and the Greek word for right is rigid quality. Being right's not soft. Forgive me for this, but my, my dad we was talking about tact and how some people don't have tact. And, and tact is how you talk to somebody and you get you get progress out of them. You deal with somebody, you had a problem with somebody, and you deal with them, but, but you do it in a way that, that it's gentle. And, and my dad said, son, there's a right way and a wrong way to tell a woman she's overweight. Really, Dad? I'm going to get some evidence. And I said, okay, what's the right way? He said, I've not found it yet. <laughs> somebody laughed a little too hard on that. I, there's a right way and a wrong way to handle every situation. And the word for rigid quality, sometimes the truth hurts. And it's tough. It's rigid. 
things that are pure, which is undefiled, things that are lovely, which is dear to the heart, things that are excellent. This is praiseworthy. And the Greek word for praiseworthy or excellent is holy silence. You don't have to come up and defend it. It speaks for itself. In the book of Revelation, it's talked to 24 elders, and around the 24 elders there's thousands and thousands upon angels. And what happens when the lamb enters the room? You don't have to explain this is the lamb of God. You don't have to say this is the lamb of Judah. He just enters the room and they fall to their knees and the singing and celebration begins. Glory to God in the highest. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Why? Because the lamb of God who takes away sins entered the room and they knew it without question. That's the holy silence. It speaks on its own merit. Oh, man. Heaven. Heaven. Whatever you're going through now is temporary. In a few, some of you, it may take a few years, but in a, in a while, in a while, you're going to talk about how you got through it. Right now, you may not see the light at the end of the tunnel. I and Todd Johnson are training for the BAK. He's talked me into doing it next year. And, and uh, we're training, and, and it's 495 miles, but you can stretch it out to 520, I think, if you want to. On average, about 65 miles a day is what they're averaging for eight days, something like that. The first leg of the thing is about 17, 17 to 20 miles. You get on a track like that on a bicycle and you ask yourself, what am I thinking? What am, what, you know, and, and, and have you ever bit off more than you can chew? Let me, let me tell you guys. I believed in this football team from the first loss. I said, they can make it to state. You can go back and look at some of my sermons, and I said that. I believe in this team because of the heart, the dedication, the focus, the determination. You got a little bit of ability, but I'm moving past that. But now let's put that in a spiritual realm. What about determination in our spiritual realm? I want to know Christ more, Philippians 3. What about thinking about these things? Now I want to ask you, what did you think about last week? Did everything you think about line up with these words? Was it pure? Was it noble? Was it upright? Was it lovely? Was it excellent? Was it true? Was it praiseworthy? Maybe that's why we have so much stinking thinking. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For the way a man thinks, so shall he be. Proverbs 4, 23, we heard it last week, and I'm going to say it again, and I hope that you took that challenge on. Keep your heart with all diligence, for it springs out the issues of the life. Peace in all circumstances. Verse 10 says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying that because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. You see, this chapter, and if you get a chance, go home and read Philippians, the book, all at once, all four chapters. It'll just, it'll just pop in your head. All these different things will just open up to you in your life. And here, what he's doing, he's building upon his argument. First, he tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Here's what you've put in your head. And he tells us the different things to focus on, whatever is in this thing. Then he says, I've learned the secret of being content. Look at verse 12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret. What's the secret of being content? It's what's going in the head. What are you focusing on? Satan wants to deter and distract you from your goal. And God says, keep your focus. Keep your focus. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, 
Then he says, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things. You want to have a scary opponent. You go up against an opponent that doesn't fear loss. I love this definition. It says, a good definition of a Christian is one who is completely fearless, continually cheerful, and constantly in trouble. You see, my circumstances don't define my joy. A good definition of a Christian is one who is completely fearless, continually cheerful, and constantly in trouble. It goes on to say this, it is the continual rejoicing in the midst of trouble that marks the Christian life. The mark of a true Christian is a smile of confidence despite my circumstances, sometimes through tears, but a smile nonetheless. Christians who do this and who know how to rejoice and believe in rejoicing have a dangerous confidence. What makes you step out on faith? A dangerous confidence. What makes you willing to do what God asks you to do, to, to take on the big mountain in front of you? What gives you that determination, that drive, that edge, that focus? The joy inside of you. God, I want to see what you're going to do. Do you know some of us are in situations because of us? We, we make some, some bad choices. But we have a God who wants to take that too. We have a God who wants us to feel the joy of the Lord. Our strength is based on what we invest in. What do you invest in your time in? Our joy is based on what we focus on. What's your focus? What are you focusing on? I'm focusing on heaven. Our hope is based on what we trust in. Hebrews says that our hope is based on what we know to be true. It's, it's, it's what we're trusting. I'm not trusting in me. I'm going to fail. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ. I know he's going to get it done. And when our strength and our hope and our joy are based on all the same thing, you're dangerous. There is nothing ahead of you that you cannot conquer because your strength is in him, your hope is in him, and your joy is in him, not in your surroundings, not in your circumstances. You become dangerous. Fearless. The cross without the Spirit, you dry up. The Spirit without the cross, you puff up. But you put the two together and you grow up. So has Jesus become real to you yet? I love the song in the garden and he walks with me and he talks with me he knows your innermost secrets and he loves you anyway I fill this with water that's what it is it's water okay you don't have to be nervous now don't taste it later just trust me okay Cade? all right Jesus was with the woman at the well and said, give me something to drink. She's like, we don't have nothing to put it in. And he said, well, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for something to drink. Because the water I give you is the water of life. You'll never thirst again. And she said, give me that water so I don't ever have to come back here again. And he says, I'm the water of life. Man. When you fill your life with Jesus, what does Psalms 23 say? My cup overflows when you fill your life with Jesus you can't get a big enough joy juice jar it's constantly being filled he constantly wants to just fill you and pour into you he just wants you to have so much excitement we was asked by a man to go down to to do a to lead a, a youth camp down in Arkansas 
And, and uh, I found out that the toothbrush was invented in Arkansas. Who, who knew that? Because if it was anywhere else, it would be a teeth brush. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's good. That's, yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Anyway, and the guy asked me, he said, would you come on down? And, and so he called me on Friday. We had to leave Sunday right after church. We shot down there. Uh, I think we had, I don't know if we skipped church. I don't remember the whole details, but we got to go a whole week down in Arkansas. I got to take my boys to Arkansas. We went down there, and we found out we were just 60 miles from Louisiana, West Monroe, Louisiana. And I said, do we have some time off? Yeah, you have some time off. So we went into West Monroe, Louisiana. We went to Duck Dynasty. We went to their, to their uh, warehouse. We almost got hit by one of the guys with their big trucks. And, oh, just hit me. Oh, I'll sell it for 100000 I even tried to back up a little bit. He didn't hit me. We got to experience a lot of things in life. And I told my boys every time, I said, now, guys, this is because we're following Jesus. These experiences is because we said, Lord, we'll do whatever you ask. And sometimes that yes is an awful big yes. We went down there not knowing how we are going to pay for the trip. I mean, honestly, we're sitting there going, man, this is going to cost a lot of money. And the guy says, oh, here we, we pay for people to, to come to camp. I'm like, really? Yeah. And I'm thinking I'll get a couple hundred dollars to, to you know, it'll, it'll help offset the cost for fuel. We, pay, we got paid a thousand bucks. So it paid our way. And what was funny is we was needing to buy a new car, and my neighbor had a car. And I said, well, how much you want for the car? And he says, well, if you have $1,000, you can have it. Ain't God good? I don't have a bunch of money in the bank. I don't want a bunch of money in the bank. I want to know Jesus has got my back. So no matter what the circumstances, can you say, and yet I'll rejoice? What if you go to the doctor and they say, we're sorry to inform you, but you've only got a few weeks to live. Can you say, and yet I'll rejoice? What about if it's when you take one of your children to the doctor and the doctor says, we're sorry to inform you. Can you say, and yet, I'll rejoice. What about if the bank account dries up? The job tells you um, this is your last week. What if you leave the hospital without your child? Can you say, and yet I'll rejoice? Being a Christian, it isn't easy. It's, it, it's dangerous. But man, do you feel that joy deep inside of you? Do you feel maybe that your enemy, the devil, has stolen it from you? Do you feel defeated today? It's prayer time. It's invitation time. A few of our elders are going to come forward. And maybe you're that person. That, maybe I'm not thinking straight. Would you help me with my thinking? And I don't know why you come. I don't want to know why you're coming forward. If these men that we have, or maybe you want need to pray with one of the ladies, pull somebody to the side and leave here today rejoicing. Despite your circumstances, I'm going to go out skipping and singing and praising God. No matter what, I'm going to praise him because someday I'm going to see him face to face. And he's going to come up to me with those nail-scarred hands and he's going to tell me, well done. And I'm going to get across that finish line. I'm going to step into heaven and I'm going to hear, man, you made it. I'm not going to live this life defeated because of circumstances. Don't leave here defeated. Leave here rejoicing.